those mountain tops there in South Korea, those aerial views like in this picture on the screen of those ski runs, the perspective from the top of those ski jump towers or that snowboarding half pipe, the shimmer of Olympic ice. And even more than those fabulous scenes has been the expressions that the cameras have captured on the faces of the athletes as they win or as they lose, as they disappoint or as they amaze. Not only do these winter athletes get to experience being literally on the tops of mountains, they also ex are experiencing that figuratively. They experience the elation of competing with the best of the best, that exhilaration of being at the top of their game and in top physical condition, and they're pushing their bodies to the limits of their strength and endurance and grace. They're overcoming injuries. They're conquering their fears. One particular story caught my attention this last week, and it had to do with conquering fear. Casey Andringa, a 22-year-old mogul skier who was born in Milwaukee. He was an unlikely competitor. NBC Sports called him the biggest surprise on the 241-member U.S. Olympic team. Casey had dreamed of being in the Olympics since he was six years old, and yet he had never placed in a single national competition. In addition, he'd suffered many setbacks. He had a fractured skull when he was 14. He had a near fatal case of meningitis when he was 18. Casey was about to quit the sport a year ago when a friend sent him a message on Twitter that asked, are you afraid? The comment struck a deep chord in him and he asked himself if that was true. Was he afraid to continue to reach for his lifelong dream? And it propelled him then to renew his efforts. Casey and his brother spent the entire summer living in a pop-up camper in the Colorado mountains so that Casey could train each day without any distractions. He made a big sign with the Olympic rings and those words, are you afraid? And he stuck it above his bed in that pop-up camper. He put the words on a bumper sticker on his helmet. And Casey went from not even being in the top three tiers of athletes that were um, being considered for the Olympics in May to making a spot on the team. He made it to that mountaintop. We've made a big leap in the Gospel of Mark from Sundays when we were focusing on chapters 1 and 2, focusing on the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and now we've leaped all the way to chapter 9, to that climactic point in the middle of the story. It's a mountaintop story. Only there was no gondola or ski lift to get Jesus and the disciples up to the top. They, Jesus and Peter and James and John, had to hike up this high mountain. They worked hard to get there. Just like those Olympic athletes have worked hard to get where they are at the Olympic mountaintop. And the experience from the top was exhilarating. It was even terrifying. Mark explains that it's the terror, it was the fear that prompted Peter's response. Suddenly, at the top of the mountain, Jesus becomes blazing bright, whiter than bright white or tide bright or any detergent or bleach could get him. And then Elijah and Moses appear beside him in that shimmering brilliance. And Peter blurts out, let's build three shelters, three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Poor Peter. He has gotten a bad rap for his reaction to that incredible mountaintop experience. And ever since then, the background music for this part of the story is everyone's groans and the shaking of their heads 
as they wonder over Peter's misguided words. The word tabernacle has been adapted in our English translation, so when I read it out of the NIV, it said shelters, and in other translations it'll say tents. It's been adapted so we could understand, but the result of that is that we miss some of the context. And we miss the fact that there's more sense to what Peter says than he's given credit for. The Jews have an annual celebration called the Festival of Tabernacles. It's a commemoration of God's presence with the Israelites through those 40 years in the desert when they lived in these tent-like shelters that they called tabernacles. The prophet Zechariah later spoke about this festival of tabernacles when he prophesied that the day of the Lord's coming was going to be on that festival of tabernacles, that on that festival, God would usher in this new age, this uh, time when God would arrive to take control of the world and to bring in this age of peace. And so even now, when the Jews celebrate this festival of tabernacles, that whole week of celebration culminates in a time, a night that they call the night of grand illumination. And they light these great lamps, 75 foot tall lamps that they light that illuminate the temple. They're a symbol of God's presence. And they uh, remind them of God's presence with them as pillars of fire in the wilderness. So Peter makes this connection in his terrified brain. Here is Jesus dazzling bright like one of those blazing lamps. God's glory has arrived, Peter must have thought. This is the day of the Lord's coming, just as Zechariah had prophesied. And if it's supposed to happen on the Festival of Tabernacles, then we had better hurry up and build those tabernacles. I'm sure that's what he was thinking. And he's actually on the right track. God really had arrived in their midst in Jesus. God had come take control of the world and to usher in his age of peace at these pockets of control and peace within the hearts of believers and with, within the community of faithful followers. So Peter got it partly right, but just partly. And so God has to speak up and say in essence, hold your horses, we'll get there, but first things first. What God actually said was, this is my son, whom I love. And that was the most important thing that Peter and the others needed to know. The next thing they needed to be reminded of was to listen to him. As we wonder, what is it that they were supposed to listen to? And that's not just listening to hear, but listening to heed. We just need to look back into the chapter that comes before in Mark's account in chapter 8 we find the story of Jesus asking the disciples who they think he is the disciples report that some people think he's Elijah and others think he's Moses and then Jesus asks but who do you think who do you think I am and Peter bless his heart gets it right you are the Messiah, the Christ, he answers. Except again, Peter only gets it partly right. Because Peter's understanding of what it means to be the Messiah has to be corrected. And that's what Peter needs to listen to. Because right after that declaration that Peter makes, Jesus begins to share with them what it means to be the Messiah and to be a follower of the Messiah. And there's three key things that Jesus says that they're to listen to, they're to hear and to heed. And the first, Jesus explained that he's gonna suffer many things. He'll be rejected by the elders and the leaders. He'll be killed and after three days be raised up 
alive. It's a different kind of Messiah than Peter and the others were expecting. Jesus is a savior who suffers, who's willing to give his life for his people, who is going to defeat death and rise to life, bringing hope to those who also suffer, to those who also face death, who also need hope. Next, Jesus speaks of what it's going to be involved, what's involved in being his disciple. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I like the way Eugene Peterson puts that in the message translation. He wrote, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me, and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. And then thirdly, Jesus speaks of the promise of what's to come. To those gathered around, he says, he continues, if any of you are embarrassed over me and the way I'm leading when you get around your fickle and unfocused friends, know that you'll be an even greater embarrassment to the Son of Man when he arrives in all the splendor of God, his Father, with an army of holy angels. Jesus adds, some of you standing here are going to see it happen. See the kingdom of God arrive in full force. So Peter was not a blustering idiot when he suggests building those ta tabernacles to signify God's arrival God's coming of glory and power. The problem is that Peter wants to skip right to the end. He wants to skip all the stuff in between. He wants to stand on that Olympic mountain without having to put in the hard work of training. He wants to skip to the reward without the suffering. He wants to skip to the resurrection without the cross. I had some similar thoughts this week as I held my precious new granddaughter, and I figured out a way to get a picture of her into our PowerPoint. There. <laughs> <laughs> so I could brag on her. <laughs> Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Kara put in some suffering in order to give me that privilege of holding beautiful Amara. And then as I held Amara and thanked God for her. I also wanted to bless her. Only each time I started to ask God to allow her to be someone who was going to make this real mark on the world, someone who might be this great peacemaker or great leader or great healer, I would hesitate as my mind would suddenly be filled with all the images of the difficulties and the painful challenges and the suffering that she might have to endure to reach greatness. As I held little Amara, I was afraid for her of the great struggle that people who achieve great things almost inevitably endure. I wanted her to reach the mountaintop, but without having to go on the journey. On Wednesday, we entered the season of Lent. The season of journeying with Jesus to the cross. Traditionally, it's a time of repentance, of self-denial, of choosing to enter into Jesus' suffering in some small way. It's a journey that many of us would prefer to avoid. We would rather skip the death threats and the betrayals that go with Jesus' journey, that we would prefer to skip Good Friday's pain and loss, to skip the tears at the tomb, and skip directly to Easter's glory and joy. But on that mountaintop, God said, listen to my beloved son. Jesus led Peter and James and John back down the mountain, back into a journey 
that held suffering and self-sacrifice. They didn't descend the mountain, the same men who had climbed it, however. They returned to that journey changed, transformed. The word transfigure, which is used to describe how Jesus' appearance changed or transformed on that mountaintop. To be transfigured means to be transformed into something more beautiful or exalted. That's why we call it the transfiguration. But Jesus wasn't the only one transfigured or transformed by that experience. I believe that God intended Peter and James and John to also be transfigured in some way, to be changed when they returned down the mountain to the valley and to their continuing journey with Jesus. As the Olympic athletes are interviewed this week, I've heard reporters ask questions like, so how is this achievement going to change your life? How is it going to impact you going forward? We all know that they can't stay on that mountaintop in Pyeongchang in South Korea, and so we wonder, will they return to life arrogant and self-important from having won a medal? Or will they return to life humbled and somehow no longer afraid of challenges? A reporter interviewed Casey Andringa, and he asked, will you now take down the sign that's over your bed that reads, are you afraid? And in case you missed his race, on Casey's final run down the mountain, he made the last minute decision to do a cork 10 for his last jump. It was a risky move to use a trick that he had landed in practice, but never in a competition. But he glanced at a piece of paper in his pocket on which he had written the words, are you afraid? And he decided to give it his all. Casey wobbled a bit on landing that cork 10, and that kept him off the medal stands. But he finished fifth when he had entered the Olympics ranked at, 17, at 19th, sorry. And he was changed, he said, no longer afraid, no longer feeling that he should hold back in case he might be embarrassed or hurt. He was transformed to live boldly. I guess that's what we hope for all of our Olympic athletes, that they might return not just to talk about their glory days on the mountain, but that they would be changed some way within them that would be noticeable in the way they live their lives. Peter told James and John, Jesus, Told Peter and James and John not to tell anyone about their mountaintop experience. They weren't to talk about it, but they were to be changed by it. People were to see the change. They were to see that they acted differently. They were to be listening to Jesus more, following his lead, willing to endure difficulties, willing to suffer, to journey to the cross with Jesus not to be embarrassed or afraid. How about you? Having put your faith in Jesus, are you willing to be transformed for the journey? To be changed by the hope and glory that's to come? Will you be going forward as one prepared to live boldly for Jesus Christ, willing to take risks, willing to lay it all on the line for the mission of bringing Jesus' kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. My prayer for you and for baby Amara and for me is that we might be forever transformed by Jesus Christ and not afraid of this journey with him through life, whatever the journey may bring. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. It's number 539.